Okay, there's a, a nice section in chapter 18 on species and speciation. So we're going to describe how new species can form and, and how speciation occurs. And I think before I do that, I want to talk about what is a species. Because um, it's uh, we, we all hear the word, but it has kind of specific biological dis definitions. It's a type of organism. Okay, in this case, there's a picture of a bear, a grizzly bear. And the scientific name is Ursus arctus. And, um, and that's, that's what we refer to it biologically. But in, in when it gets to evolution, it gets a little more complicated because um, it's not always so neat. Sometimes it, there's, it gets fuzzy. So it's, it's defined as groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations which are reproductively isolated from other such groups. So species are composed of populations whose members can mate with each other and produce fully fertile offspring. These, these groups are reproductively isolated. They do not mate with other groups or do not produce fertile offspring. So it's a, there's interbreeding. That's a key part of the population. And an all, another key part is the idea that they share genes. Um, and, and this gets harder when we talk about organisms that are asexual um, because then it doesn't take two parents to produce an offspring. But this shared gene pool is an important idea. And so there's, you know, how do these new groups come about? How do new species develop? Um, and, and the answer, in short, is reproductive isolation. Uh, and so, so you know, reproductive isolation here. That this is a joke, but but it's it's that other organisms can't or won't breed with them, and so uh, they're they're kind of left on their own. They're only going to breed with their own type, and so so we can think of a variety of reasons that there's reproductive isolation. Maybe they're isolated in on an island. Uh, which we think is a really important thing, or some barrier that's limited them to meeting other organisms that they might potentially breed with, or their behaviors isolate them, or they're only found in one type of habitat, or they breed only at a very specific time, and they have mating or fertilization, um, you know, peculiarities that limit to them. And we think this is really, really important, and that it once they differ enough, that hybrids between two individuals are at such a disadvantage that um, there's no longer movement from of genes from one area to another. The most likely of these mechanisms, the one we're most sure about, is called geographic speciation. That an isolated population uh, that where individuals can't travel to the other population, uh, those individuals start to become different. And, and over time, they may just randomly become different enough that they can't interbreed. We see lots of times where organisms have regional varieties, but if they can still interbreed along the edges there, they're still one species. But in many cases, the geographic isolation is long enough that they organisms become different enough that if they come into contact, they don't interbreed. Um, and so if it, you have a geographic barrier like an ocean, a mountain, or a river, uh, and so islands are the best example of this, organisms can become really, really different. And so that's there you see the European bison. Uh, it forms hybrids with the uh, North American bison, but you know that just doesn't happen. And it's, they're quite different. Now they have different habitat preferences. Um, they're, they're related, but no longer interbreeding. This, uh, this is referred to, this geographic speciation is referred to as allopatric, meaning happening in different areas. There can also be sympatric speciation, where it happens in the same area, but we think this is the most likely mechanism of speciation. Um, and so there's, we, th we think this particularly happens on iso on, in isolated islands. We think it happens in habitat patches. We think this is one of the most important ways speciation occurs. Um, and so here's an example of, of allopatric populations that uh, originally started on different islands and then later uh, 
um, or come from a mainland and then they wind up on different islands and they change over time. And so you get separate species. Now there's other mechanisms. Your book goes into them in detail. I'm not, but but they're, they can be important as well. All right, so we think we know how species can form. Then, uh, you know, how fast does evolution change species and how do new species develop? That's a picture of a coelacanth. We have fossils that are almost 200 million years old that look a lot like living coelacanths. Um, well, a lot of it we think is gradual, okay, that there's gradual change. Um, but we also think that sometimes it can happen pretty fast. And that maybe fast is important in some times. That uh, what we think of as that in most cases the evolution is gradual, but sometimes there's periods of rapid change, particularly following mass extinctions. And then this leads to formation of new species in a quick burst or an adaptive radiation. These radiations are where closely related species have evolved from a common ancestor by adapting to new and different parts of the environment. We think these occur uh, in env environments where there are few other species and many resources. So like when, when uh, organisms reach isolated islands or whenever there's catastrophic events that lead to, to extinctions. So like in the Galapagos, Darwin found all these different types of finches. Um, and they're all related, and they were all related to tree finches from, uh, from the mainland. But here you have ground finches and cactus finches and warbler finches. And so, so we think they all come from a mainland species, but they're very different. Likewise, in Hawaii, you have this uh, radiation of all these honey creepers. They're all kind of similar, but, but they're all different. And so we think that this occurs a lot when there's open habitats. We also think this happens following some sort of key adaptation or innovation where a new trait uh, develops in a, a, a species and allows them to exploit habitats differently from any other organisms. Uh, and so like in, in islands, uh, this may happen, but it also might happen in, in areas where uh, like um, we have organisms that developed lungs, which were paired air sacs that came off the throat. And originally these, in some species, these paired air sacs be, develop into a swim bladder. But in other cases, they can burp oxygen down into them and, and uh, that allowed them to s exploit new habitats. And so um, lung fishes can, are found in, in many, many places. So in general, species, there are more species now than in the past, and that in more modern times, these species uh, generally uh, exploit more habitats and become more and more different. Over time, we've seen mass extinctions then followed by new speciation events. Um, and some of these mass extinctions have been really dramatic. Eliminating you know, the vast majority of species that were found in the fossils before then. Probably the best known of these is the Cretaceous mass extinction uh, that happened when the dinosaurs went extinct. And we think this was caused by the impact of an asteroid. We found the crater, we found evidence of the tsunami, we found evidence of widespread fire and ash almost worldwide. Okay, this was followed, this mass extinction was followed by the appearance of lots of open niches, and then the development of many new and large mammal species. So it's an example of an adaptive radiation, and that's why we're here. So to summarize, uh, we talked about species, the, what is a species and how speciation occurs, and the key importance of reproductive isolating mechanisms. We think geographic isolation is really important, but there are others as well. Uh, speciation, we think it can occur gradually or rapidly, depending on, on the conditions, but that when it does occur rapidly, often it's something called punctuated equilibrium. Okay, we'll stop there, and now we're going to talk about Mendel's genetics, and we're going to combine that with evolution.